Thank you for David. I thank you for the word you've laid on his heart, Lord. And I pray that his words will be anointed by you, that he will speak the words that you would have him speak, Lord. And for each one of us here this morning, Lord, speak to our hearts, Lord. May we have a fresh revelation through what David shares with us for you this morning, Lord, to bring you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much. It's lovely to be here this morning. Um, some of you will be relieved to know that I'm not going to get you to do any squats, lunges, or uh, press-ups, at least not for a few minutes anyway. If that breaks out spontaneously, I'm not going to hold you back. I hope you recovered well, those of you who came on the, uh, the weekend away and that Monday morning wasn't too bad, but uh, great. It's lovely just listening to the different things that have come through people this morning through a prayer about pearls. I was thinking, you know, pearls being coming about through irritation. And I remember looking at that. Apparently, uh, something that I, I hadn't planned to say this, but I think it's quite, quite pertinent. An oyster, when it gets a, a piece of grit into its shell, which happens, why it happens, I don't know, but it happens, stuff happens, doesn't it? And the oyster has two options, really. I mean, what it tries to do is to secrete a liquid that it completely surrounds that piece of grit in its shell, and it then protects it from um, getting infected and being damaged. Because obviously a piece of grit, a bit like in your shoe, isn't it, can cause you to hobble and eventually it could go septic and nasty and so on. And in fact, a piece of grit could kill the oyster or if it successfully secretes this liquid, that's what eventually turns into a pearl. So it's quite interesting. Inside of that pearl is a bit of grit. <laughs> um, but that's how it works. And perhaps stuff comes into our lives uh, that we don't really ask for. Um, and it kind of is down to how we respond, I suppose, to that. There was another bit that uh, came out in the song about hope. And I often think, you know, there, we don't know everything there is to know about God. I don't, you know, I'm not a theologian. I may have read the Bible. Um, but there's an awful lot I don't yet know about God. And... Uh, but I know enough, and perhaps this is what we need to get to, we know enough about God to trust him even when life sucks and when we can't see the way ahead. And it just reminded me of, of Peter when he'd, you know, he'd been going about his normal business, fishing, and they'd had a pretty fruitless night of it, nothing <laughs> to show for it at all. And there's Jesus you know, on the beach, um, and, you know, Jesus comes over to them and says, oh, well, just put your nets down again. And you can imagine Peter's exasperation, thinking, well, you know, you're not exactly a fisherman, are you, Jesus? We've, we're the experts. We've been doing this all night. Nothing to show for it. But the nice thing about Peter is he says, but because you say so, we'll do it. So he knew enough about this Jesus who... Let's face it, later he denied and, you know, he wasn't quite there yet. But he knew enough about Jesus to say, well, because you said, I'll, I'll do it. There was hope. He trusted enough. So it's not that we become, you know, that we know everything there is to know, but we know enough to say, okay, because you say so. I don't know whether it's just me, but... I think we all have an admiration for people who don't just talk about making a difference, but they just get on and do it. Um, perhaps this is particularly pertinent as we think about politics and changes and elections and all that. Um, but anyway, I'll come back to that. Not, not that I'm going to give a political speech or anything. Um, I had a poster in my kitchen in the 70s, which I often think about um, now, more than perhaps I did at the time. And it simply said this. It said, better to light one candle than curse the darkness. Better to light one candle 
than curse the darkness. And, you know, you can think about it. So often we look at how dark the world is or how grim the situation is, how bad this other situation is. And, and we can, you know, we're British, we moan about things. That's what we do. It's part of our culture. <laughs> So we moan about the darkness, if you like. We, we complain about the political situation or about terrorism or about this or about that. Perhaps it would be better if we just lit one candle, made the difference to one person's life, rather than moaning about how bad everything is. We have an inherent dislike, I think, for people that promise and don't deliver. All right? Or who are all talk and no action. We're guilty of, of it individually, and our in institutions also suffer from it. Uh, poli politicians' manifestos come to mind. Perhaps big companies that promise low emissions, and they turn out not to be. Um, but I don't think churches are immune either from being a lot of talk and not much action. Jesus entered our world in a specific time and date in history. Um, God is not aloof and indifferent or inactive. God entered our world by becoming flesh and living among us. That's what we call incarnation. He just did it. He came in. Jesus lived it. A life of unselfishness, unconditional love, unflinching forgiveness, outrageous generosity and grace. So it wasn't just words with God. It wasn't just a manifesto of promises. He emptied himself. He humbled himself. He loved very practically. He loved Zacchaeus, who was up the tree, and needed a boost to his self-esteem. He loved the woman that was dragged before him, uh, caught in adultery, and was being accused by the religious leaders, and, and uh, <clears throat> they expected Jesus to condemn her too, but he didn't. The story of the Good Samaritan, which just comes before um, in Luke 10, it was a story illustrating how practical people need to be. The religious leaders were the ones that passed by, weren't they? <laughs> and uh, the Samaritan, a la foreigner, was the one who was commended in that story. So here is Jesus loving practically the lame, the blind, the paralyzed, the widow, the prostitute, the hungry. He met real practical needs, lifting up the downtrodden, and, uh, and others. He fed the hungry crowds. He cooked breakfast for the disciples, um, you know, the fishermen who hadn't had a very good night. Um, he healed the sick. He was um, all about setting captives free and empowering people to be who God designed them to be. So when Jesus started his ministry, he called a few men to follow him. What does it mean to follow him? It was interesting that he, he talked to, well, we know 12 people, to say, follow me. And they left what they were doing to do what he was doing. It was a, a doing activity. Just do it. Just live it. He wasn't getting them to sign up to a particular um, theology or a particular code of practice. Just do what I'm doing. Follow me. And we can spend so much time trying to get our doctrinal ducks in a row or crossing every T and dotting every I in our theology that we never really get started on what it means to be a disciple. Jesus started his ministry after being tempted in the desert. That's uh, also in Luke chapter 4. And um, he'd been in the local synagogue where he'd grown up. And he read from Isaiah... The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed set free. It was a doing agenda, if you like. 
but it didn't go down well with the synagogue leaders when he confronted their racial prejudices. You can have a look at that in um, chapter 4 of Luke. In fact, because he alluded to the fact that God was interested in, in people from outside of the company of Israel, they tried to actually kill him. Uh, which is, it seems extraordinary for, for religious leaders um, who purport to serve a God of love. So Jesus invites us to live the life we were designed to live, following his lead, imitators of Christ, taking risks, setting aside our own agendas and aspirations to serve his purpose, to bring life, hope, peace, reconciliation, redemption, forgiveness, healing, etc., to people of every ethnicity, in every strata of society, everywhere in the world. It's a big calling. (laughs) What does being a disciple of Jesus look like in the 21st century Brexiting Britain? What does it look like? I started following Jesus in, I was just reflecting on it yesterday, 1977. That's 40 years ago. It's quite a while. Um, I didn't know the Bible very well at the start, but I knew I was loved by God and that loving God and loving people was the way of life that I had set out on. Simple. I brought a street-sleeping alcoholic home with me in the first week I was a Christian uh, to live with me. Um, Didn't go down too well with my housemates at the time, but somehow inherently I knew that, you know, God had called us to love him and love people. So, uh, you know, I I started off a bit out of the box and going going for it. Um, I got a chance shortly after that to read the whole Bible in 1978, uh, I was in hospital uh, for several months after being knocked off my motorbike and almost killed on my way to work. So for four months, got to read the Bible, which is, uh, you know, I didn't have much else to do. Came out of hospital and uh, heard someone talk about the poverty and the needs of the population in a country in South America called Bolivia. So my wife and I at the time got ready to go. We sold everything, the motorbike, the pride and joy. Um, And we did a a DTS, a discipleship training school with youth with a mission. We gained a bit of experience smuggling Christian literature into Eastern Europe, which was still uh, under communism at the time. Um, We went to Czech uh, Republic and Hungary. And we did some teaching in the underground churches. We went to serve street people in London and Guatemala, and then arrived in Bolivia, where we, for 11 years, were involved in making disciples. At the time, Bolivia wasn't known as a missionary sending country. It was more of a missionary receiving country. But as I read it, Jesus speaks to everyone, go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples of all nations. It wasn't the English church or the church of this place or that place. It was the whole church in all of the world, from everywhere to everywhere, if you like. So it's interesting now to see some years later that there are Bolivian missionaries in Afghanistan uh, that I know personally. Bolivian missionaries who are in India and a Bolivian missionary in Leicester. Um, my brother came out to, to join me. I've got a twin brother, um, 45 minutes older than me. He came to Bolivia to give us a hand for about uh, a year and uh, saw the plight of street children in Santa Cruz and started to, to engage with that work and, you know, just doing what God gave them to do. 27 years later, and he's still there. He hasn't come back yet. So he got on doing what he saw was needed. Loving, glue-sniffing street kids whose life expectancy is about 18 if they stay on the street. They'll 
either die of AIDS, die of TB, die of street, in street violence. But many of those children have, you know, you could say that the problem of street children is massive. And we could, in a sense, curse the darkness and say how terrible this situation is. Or you can rescue them one by one. Light a candle <laughs> instead of curse the darkness. And bless him, my brother's been doing that for a long time. And of, of the many that perhaps come and try out being in the, one of the homes that they built coming off the street, some of them go back. But some of them have become you know, graduates from university, some of them, uh, one of them now is a diplomat in uh, Bolivia and rescued from the street. But you're not a missionary because you go to another country. Any and everybody who decides to follow Jesus is by definition a person with a clear mission. To go into all the world and make disciples, going is, is a doing verb. Mistakenly, I think, we assume that there are missionaries, pastors, worship leaders, and youth workers, or full-timers, and then there are the rest of us who are somehow part-timers. Is there a, such a thing as part-time Christian? <laughs> or full-time Christian? Or, you know, I don't think Jesus makes that distinction. There are no followers or disciples who are part-time. And Jesus made this absolutely clear in Luke 10, 25. We didn't actually read um, that, that chunk there. But when one of the religious leaders came and said, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Um, he said, well, what do you think? And the guy said, well, I guess it's to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, all of your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. I think that's the best summary ever, you know. We don't need much more of a manifesto than that. To love God with, and it, I've emphasized all, all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, all of your mind. That was the kind of wholeheartedness. So it's not a part-time occupation, you know. If you're a pastor or a worship leader or a missionary in another country, that's not some sort of, um, you know, Christian SAS or sort of uh, the, 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 the elite that sort of go and do it. We're all called to this, full time. And Jesus' words to the religious leader when he gave that answer, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, strength and mind. Jesus said, you're right. Do this and you'll live. Conversation over. <laughs> that... Because that is really living. Two stories follow that one. The one that uh, we didn't look at was the Good Samaritan story. But I think most of us know that story well enough that we, we don't need to reread it now. But at the end of that story, the question was asked, so who was a neighbor to, to the man who fell into you know, trouble with the thieves? And I suppose the religious leader grudgingly had to admit it was the foreigner, the Samaritan, who had mercy on him. And Jesus simply said, go and do likewise. Go and do the same things. And then we read about Martha and Mary and this, this contrast between the, the Martha who's doing and doing and doing and sort of Mary who's sitting at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus affirmed that's important. Friendship with, with Christ, our first love, our primary passion in life is Jesus and his kingdom, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the other stuff, you know, is secondary. It means daring to be different, letting go of our own agenda, dying to self, living often in a way that goes against the tide of the way the world is going. To be a Christian can <laughs> seem like you're the only one swimming in the opposite direction. We could have a look at, at Luke 14, uh, just briefly. And verse 25. 
a large crowd was following Jesus and he turned around and said to them, if you want to be my disciple, you must hate everyone else by comparison. Your father, your mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. If you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. So there was, again, the emphasis on all. Compared to this first passionate love for Jesus, everything else is going to look as if it was hate. He's not recommending we hate the rest of our family members. But he is saying, to be a disciple isn't a part-time occupation. It isn't something that you can do half-heartedly. People who picked up crosses in those days, the context, remember, who picked up crosses in those days to carry them? People who were about to be nailed onto them. That's the context. We, we, we think of crosses as things we hang around our necks these days or, or, you know, put as a decoration at the front of a church. But crosses in those days were things that Romans used to nail people onto and die. So I'm not trying to be grisly here. I'm just saying that Jesus was clear that this is a change of life. If you've been going this direction all your life, a call to discipleship is going this way all your life. It's not whether you're called to go to Bolivia or called to go to another nation of the world. It's taking this life into your work now, into your community, into whatever you're doing, to do it with all of your heart. And uh, if you want to be my disciple, uh, this is what it will mean. Three stories then follow, which I won't go into now, but three stories. One was about building a tower without counting the cost. So people who, you know, got enthusiastic but didn't really think about what it was going to mean to follow Jesus for the long term. Um, the other story was about going into battle without the manpower to, you know, with an inadequate force. And then the third story was about being salt with no flavor. And then he says, you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. And we could look at that in more detail, but was Jesus trying to put off this crowd from following him? Because it started that bit that I read out. It said there was a lot of people were following Jesus. And then he says, you know what? You can't be my disciple unless, unless, unless. So, you know, he wasn't trying to get a crowd on his side. He did spell out the terms of discipleship pretty clearly. So it's not something you just add in to give a little bit of uh, you know, seasoning to your life, you know, coming to church to make it as a sort of an activity that makes you somehow respectable. Um, so you can put C of E on your, on your form when you're applying for a job <laughs> or whatever. It's, it's about a complete different way of living. So, and in, I think it's in John 6, 66, so there's another occasion when Jesus was teaching, and it managed to cause an exodus of followers. An exodus, a mass exodus. In fact, it says, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. So much so that Jesus asked the 12 if they also wanted to leave. So there wasn't a populist message, if you like, with Jesus. He wasn't saying, you know, come to me for all you can get. But I sometimes fear that there has been a, a gospel out there that's been a bit like that. Come to Jesus for all that you can get. Appealing, in a sense, to our selfishness, if you like. You know, well, if I come to Jesus, I'll get this and I'll get that. I'll get a ticket to heaven. I'll, I'll be slightly more um, protected from adversity, slightly less sick, slightly more economically prosperous, slightly, you know, we kind of subtly got this idea that following Jesus makes, makes it better in a, in a material and practical sense for us. I don't know where that idea comes from. As far as we're aware, at least 11 of the 12 disciples died an early death. Um, most of them crucified upside down and other horrible things. I'm not, you know, but where do we get this idea of more prosperity, more health, more uh, an easier life by becoming a Christian? Jesus himself died at 33. 
Okay, he rose from the dead. But, you know, we also, we also, as many of you know, uh, one of my daughters also died at 21 in a crash. And I, I, dealing with that was one of the hardest things to deal with in my life. So it's not supposed to happen, is it? But she finished her race early. Her, the whole objective of her life was to live it for Jesus to, wholeheartedly. And to finish the race was to be with him. In my better days, I could think of that as she's got there already ahead of me. Yeah? And that is actually the truth I need to, to put my feet down on and believe that she, you know, has been a light to this world and continues to be, actually, through the, the life that she lived. Being a disciple of Jesus may not, therefore, be the most comfortable life. Peter when asked, you know, when Jesus turns to the twelve and says, are you leaving as well? Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. That's, that's his answer. This is the only way to go. Even if this road is strewn with griefs and difficulties and struggles, you, you are the only one who's promised eternal life. You are the hope to which we hold. So we don't become followers of Jesus for our own convenience, but simply because no one else has the words of eternal life. We are free to follow whatever path we choose in life. But life in all its fullness is only truly found in living it in relationship with Jesus. So this all, all, all and all, loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's a, it's a wholehearted decision. When I decided to get married, the commitment to, to Liz was not, well, I'll love you with most of my heart. There'd be a question, uh, and uh, where's the other bit? <laughs> Wandering off somewhere. You don't commit to love somebody half-heartedly, do you? Otherwise, there wouldn't be many successful marriages around. You, you go into things wholeheartedly, even if there are difficulties and struggles and you know, problems along the way. It's, it's a wholehearted thing. We know that love is a wholehearted thing by its very nature. Um, I was rem reminded of a book that I read some time ago, and some of you might be very familiar with it. It has a, the wonderful title, If You Want to Walk on Water, You Have to Get Out of the Boat. And uh, I love the, that illustration. If you want to walk on water, you have to get out of the boat. And you could see that getting out of the boat is either profoundly risky, uncomfortable, you know, could sink, could drown, or you see it as exhilarating. And I don't know what kind of person you are. Some people, let's face it, are more protectionist and more, um, I don't like change, and I like to sort of stay safe and stay in my comfort zone. And I know that some people are more wired that way. And some people are, what the heck, let's give it a try. Peter was a bit like that, wasn't he? You know, he was, well, since you're saying it, Jesus... I'm going to get out of the boat. And he gave it a try. And all credit to him. I don't know anyone else who's tried that, you know. It was a bit... I think Jesus had a bit of a twinkle in his eye when, because when basically Peter had said, Lord, if that's you, tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus goes, hmm, really? <laughs> okay. Because he didn't serve any other purpose, really. Walking on water, let's face it, wasn't... It wasn't we didn't get anybody saved. It didn't, you know, it, it was kind of a bit of fun, really. I think Jesus was having with his best friend. I might be, you know, I might be interpreting that wrongly, but but he wanted to see just where Peter's heart was at, because he he had a tendency to uh, to be a bit, um, in, what's the word, impulsive, didn't he, Peter? Let's put it that way. But there he goes. He risks it all 
to gain all. And that's what we do if we live a life of following Jesus. We, we risk it all to gain it all. So what, where might it lead? This wholehearted attitude of love for God and others? Is it going to lead to more church services? More theological studies? More tea and cucumber sandwiches? Or more going into the world and living like Jesus? I'm being a bit facetious, I know. But Jesus was known, and I think this is a title we ought to cover, Jesus was known as a friend of sinners. That's what the religious leaders kind of accused him of. And I I suspect that Jesus was very pleased with that title. Are we known as friends of sinners as well? Is that what we're mostly known as? And I want to sort of qualify that sinners thing because it doesn't sound, you know, what, what do we mean by that? Let's face it. Is there anyone that you know that's sinless? Okay, so if we're a friend of sinners, we're a friend of everybody. <laughs> that's the bottom line, isn't it? Friend of everybody. A friend to everybody. He always sought, and I'm going to go through a list here, he always sought to include others, to accept others, to love others unconditionally, to value others, respect others, lift others up, to honor others, serve others, train others, coach others, encourage others, support, walk alongside, believe in others, instill hope in others, equip others, forgive others, heal others, reconcile, redeem, give, be compassionate, merciful. Are you getting bored? Sorry. But he was All of those things to the people that he was called to live with, whether they were at the gym, whether they were in your office, whether they were the people that you are in a college course with, those are the people whom we are to love. The Jesus way of life is life-giving, just like oxygen. Living for self is ultimately... Taking, consumerist, taking advantage of, looking out for number one. And that is not the life we're called to anymore. Repent means to rethink, to think again. Repent. Repenser in French, isn't it? To rethink. So we think differently. We've turned around. We now no longer live for self, but live for Christ. So Jesus speaks of laying down his life for his friends. And his friends are sinners, and we've already established that means everyone. Laying down our lives, carrying the cross, counting the cost, is not perhaps what we think it will be. Somebody once said, didn't they? Didn't they? He is no fool who lays down that which he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. As disciples, we are missionaries called to love God and love people to blossom where we are planted. And I I recognize this. Sometimes people are sitting in church waiting for God's call. I'm thinking, what what are you waiting for? God's call has already been given to go into all the world, to love people wherever you are. It's not, you know, that I wait in church until I'm called to Bolivia. (laughs) Paul was called to the Gentiles, if you like. So he's making plans to go here and plans to go there and plans to go everywhere. Along the way, he gets shipwrecked. So he starts blossoming where he was planted on an island where he didn't plan to be. He didn't plan to be in prison. But he started to live a Jesus life among the prisoners and among the the guards. Wherever he was planted, he started to be who he... You know, Jesus had made him to be. So the mission field isn't somewhere else. It's here and now where you are. It's all around us. It's where we are. For me, it was the civil service for a few years. (laughs) Then it was in YWAM in Bolivia and other countries in South America. Today, it's as a personal trainer with my colleagues and clients. As a neighbor in my street, in the gym, everywhere. 
is our mission field. The need is great. So, as Nike goes, it just do it. Get out of the boat. Blossom where you're planted. Better to light one candle. And I think of, you know, sometimes I think of this, the power of one, one person, you know, the, the power of somebody like Mother Teresa, you know, who decided that loving the people that were dying was worth it. Brother Andrew, you know, the Open Doors Ministry, you know, took risks taking Bibles into the communist countries. Corrie Ten Boom, you know, from uh, that famous book that many of you might have read, who loved Jewish people and protected them and had to face concentration camp and the death of her mother, uh, sorry, her sister and father as a result. And there's my brother, you know, frankly, out there, could have had a more comfortable life in, in England, perhaps, but living among street kids and the heartbreak of disappointment, seeing some of them die, some of them go back to their old ways, but seeing some of them come through and, and living a life that honors God and so on. So the power of one to make a difference. We have that power to live in relationship with the one who has the words of eternal life. And I'll just finish a little bit something that came to me as uh, I was praying this morning. I don't know if you noticed, we're constantly invited to rate this experience or that product, to write a review of, do you know what I mean, all the time. And I wonder how good our review or our rating would be in Jesus' assessment of us as a church, as an individual. I wonder sometimes if we put most of our energy into the wrong things, or majoring on minors, as I sometimes put it. The depth and quality of our love for God and for people is, I believe, highest on his priorities, rather than perhaps our church attendance, our religious observances. Again, check out the, the Samaritan story again. I had this picture of Christchurch a bit, being like an incubator. Everyone in the community of believers here has seeds, has the word of God, has the life of Christ. And they have, you all have ideas, creative initiatives. And here, they can be encouraged and nurtured and, and uh, watered and fed and tended with gentleness and respect and the wise input of others. But it's a bit like seedlings that are grown in the greenhouse. The destiny of a seedling is to be planted out there where it can really grow and where it can you know, become something that bears fruit and you know, is, is useful to feed others and meet the needs of the community and the world. So really a church, perhaps any church, is a place where seeds are allowed to germinate. This is a safe place where you can share your ideas and get some wise input. And these seedlings can then sprout. And when they're big enough and strong enough and there's a bit of shape to them, they can get planted out into the community. It's interesting you've got this community center right next door. So it's very interesting. And I don't know what it would be, what these seedling ideas are. Debt advice? Postnatal exercise, in my case, this is what I do. Possibly still the only middle-aged man in the country doing postnatal exercise classes, <laughs> mums and babies. After-school care, tutoring kids, serving the lonely and the elderly, being a carer for someone. I don't know, but there's plenty of ideas here that, that will take you out there, will take you into the community to get you like leaven into the dough and uh, making a difference, lighting a candle and so on. I've said probably more than enough, so I better pray and finish here and uh, leave the seedlings sprouting. Father, I thank you that we got through this morning without me making anybody do any burpees or um, press-ups this morning. But I, I thank you too that you're 
you're looking at us and reviewing us and rating us in a perhaps a completely different way to the way we're imagining. You're not sitting there disappointed with us or berating us or in some way putting us down. You're lifting us up. You're nurturing us. You're saying, I love you with a passion. I put this vision in you, this, this desire in you, this initiative in you, this this little candle in you to make a difference in the world. And I just pray, Father, that this would be a really nurturing community, a, a community that looks out not just for the needs of one another, but also the needs of the wider community, the, not just Bushmead, I mean the, the world. The world is in, in Bushmead, pretty much, and it's from all nations. But uh, I pray that you really give us a sense as we have these meetings together and house group meetings and so on that, that we get a, an idea of which are the ideas to, to get going on. That we'd get out of the boat, we'd effectively walk on water, we'd, we'd believe you for things to be different, uh, for change to happen um, in the community to which we've been called as missionaries here. In the name of Jesus. Amen.